Good afternoon, welcome to our presentation about manufacturing battery modules. We suggest doing it by wire bonding and our proposal would be to start small and think big. A brief overview over the next 20 minutes or so. We'll be talking about who we are and where we are located, uh, about what we do and what we can do for you in terms of equipment, but also what we can do for you in terms of services. FNS Bontec is a company based in Austria. This is not exactly the view out of our office window, but it's close enough. This is Salzburg and we're about 40 minutes away from Salzburg and a little over an hour east of Munich and Munich Airport. So we're quite easy to reach. We are an Austrian company. We have close to 40 employees. It's closer to 45 at the moment, actually. And uh, a few of them have been in business of wire bonding for semiconductors for over 40 years, so we have quite a lot of experience. Here is the company. Uh, the guy in the middle with the red tie is Siegfried Seidel. He's the owner and general manager and has been with the company from day one when it was founded about uh, over 25 years ago. Now, what do we do? Uh, well, in terms of battery modules, uh, we are concentrated on the field of small cylindrical cells type 18650 or 21700. That's what a lot of battery modules such as in the Tesla cars are made up of. These cells need to be connected together, need, need to be wired up to make modules. Um, and we make the equipment to do this. We make wire bonders that are usually mostly used in semiconductors, but that are, have become quite popular for connecting battery modules. So this is what we do. And here is a very typical uh, battery module uh, made up of, in this case, 40 cells of the 18650 type. These need to be wired up and as you can, as you can already see, there are numbers of wires uh, that are connecting these cells on the top side. So our proposal really for this process is to use wire bonding. This is the machines uh, that we do and here you already see the process running. It's simple enough. <clears throat> you can see that we draw a wire from one pole to another, uh, weld it on both ends and then cut it off uh, so we can make a new bond. Uh, and the, the next wire going on. So this works a little bit like a sewing machine. It's a process that's been around for many years. It's a very reliable process. But what's very interesting for us in this purpose, in this particular field, is that it's a very, very flexible process. You don't need any stamped or pre-manufactured connectors. You just use a wire or ribbon, uh, which is handled in the machine and comes out of the machine at just the length and the amount that you require. So anytime you have a different module or a design change, all you do is <coughs> you reprogram the bonder. You don't do anything else. Uh, you don't need any new parts. All you need to do is to change the bond program. Um, anytime uh, you have uh, changes in the parts like different height variations or positional changes of the individual cells that can move around a little bit from one module to another, uh, the bonder doesn't, uh, can handle that quite easily. It's very tolerant to variations in height or position because it can uh, readjust the, the bonding positions to that. You can also do things like chaining bonds, as you can see here, where you have one bond after another without cutting the wire in between. Uh, that's very easy too. Uh, you can even make both bonds on the same side of the cell, so both uh, connections to the plus and the minus pole can be on the top side of the cell, which is useful for certain designs. And also, you do not have to flip the whole module when bonding it, which is another advantage. In addition, uh, you save the headspace for one bond, so you have a lower total of bond height of the module and um, you have the entire rest, you have the entire circumference and the bottom of the cell available for cooling or for thermal management because all the electric connections are on the top side. That can be an advantage depending on what your module design calls for. Here is another module design that you can see uh, the 
minus pole is connected here on the rim to the plus pole on the other side. And as you can see here, this works perfectly well with exactly the same process you saw before. First bond, second bond and cut, first bond, second bond and cut. And this works with very high yield and excellent, um, excellent reproducibility. For this, by the way, we use a pattern recognition unit to locate the bond exactly where we want it on the rim. And if the cell uh, positioning isn't always the same from one part to another, the pattern recognition unit evens that out. You can see here, this is what the pattern recognition unit in the bonder sees, and it, it can locate uh, the, the bond exactly and correct for, the, for this positioning without any problems. So we're extremely flexible also in the sense that uh, we can bond to an outside bus bar or we can bond to a battery management system, which could even be at a very different height. Uh, we can easily bond 20 millimeters up or down without any trouble uh, for wiring. You can see this here. We are bonding to these aluminum um, bus bars that are outside uh, the battery module. And of course, that's just a different uh, part of the bond program. We don't need to change anything else in the bonder. Here, we, in the next slide, we have even a complete unit where the bus bars are between all the cells. So we do not connect cells to cells, but we connect all the, bus bar, uh, all the cells directly to a bus bar. This just depends on the electrical design uh, that you like to have. Now, we're often asked what kind of current can you use? Well, um, depending on the wire you use and depending on the material, you could go up to as far as about 60 amps, but that's already the fusing current. Typically, we use a lot less. Uh, for an aluminum wire of, alum of 400 microns diameter, typically the fusing current is close to 25 amps, and of course you would derate this by a factor of two or three. So most of our customers who use 400 micron wire, and by the way, this is the most widely used wire, um, the currents they use would typically be in the range of about 10 amps. And of course, if you need more than 10 amps, uh, you could use several wires, so one or two or even three wires. You could even go further by using aluminum ribbon. And as you can see here in this table from Hereus, uh, depending on the width of the ribbon and also depending on whether you use copper or aluminum, the currents can be two or three times as high. Incidentally, hardly anybody uses copper because copper has, as you can easily see, copper has much higher fusing current and it also has lower resistivity, but it is much, much heavier than aluminum. It's about three times the weight of aluminum and it doesn't have quite twice the conductivity. So if you want to save weight, you actually still would use aluminum rather than copper. Price-wise, there's not a big difference. Uh, well, there is a big difference uh, if you use ribbon or uh, wire. Ribbon, which is a flat kind of uh, connector, can be used in the bonder just like just like wire, but it is more expensive. So it has a larger cross-section, but in the end, most people prefer to use uh, several wires rather than one ribbon, simply because it comes out cheaper. A little bit about the technology of wire bonding itself. Uh, how does it work? Well, it is actually a welding process that does not use any heat. We, in fact, the welding is done by friction. And all you do is you, you bring the two welding partners, the wire and the surface of the battery cell, into intimate contact so that the crystal lattices of the wire and of the substrate actually see each other and form a connection just like so. This friction welding has been a process that's been around for many, many years. And for, wire, uh, for semiconductor wiring, it's been also used for over 50 years now. So it's a very well-established process. What is interesting is that, of course, because it's a semiconductor industry process, the yields are extremely high and the reliability is excellent. Typically, we really do have 100% yield, which is much better than you typically have in processes like um, resistance welding or even uh, other welding or soldering types. In fact, there are billions of wire bonds that are made daily in the semiconductor industry because there it is still by far the most, uh, the most basic and the most widely uh, used process for, for all the outside connections. 
Since we don't have a molten phase, it's a solid state welding process and we have no molten phase in the entire process. So there are also no microstructural changes in the substance itself, in the metal lattice, which has the advantage of uh, we're not forming any special alloys. We, are not, uh, we don't have to worry about embrittlement and things like that. So it, it really is an, an excellent process that also produces a bulk joint. So we have no corrosion due to uh, humidity or oxygen uh, getting in between the partners like you would have uh, with a screw uh, terminal or something like that. Uh, we really have a bulk joint. And what helps us also, it is repairable. You can make a, a wire bond next to another wire bond that you remove for whatever purpose. For instance, you, you want to take out a, um, a cell that's not working. So you could simply remove the wire bond and make a new wire bond right next to it uh, without any trouble. So that's not surprising that it is actually for this kind of battery module the most popular connection technology. Uh, Tesla uses it exclusively and that's of course has already made a, a, huge, um, a huge case for it in the sense that so many bonds, so many battery modules are fabricated in that way. It's also very productive because typically you run something like one second per wire connection, as you've seen before in those movies. And that comes out to a very, very um, economical way of uh, making these connections. If you count all the, uh, all the cost of the wire and the machine plus the operator, you wind up at something like uh, roughly one euro cent per connection of course, very largely depending on the volume that you produce. So it's an interesting process in that respect as well. And just another little bit of the technology involved here. Um, what we have is a friction welding tool that seen from the side looks a little bit like this. We have a, a schematic drawn over this. What we do here is we have an ultrasonic element back here, which generates a oscillation moving back and forth at the front of this what we call transducer, and that translates itself into uh, the same movement at the tip of the tool. But we don't just move the entire tool back and forth like a chisel. In fact, it's more like what you see here. We have a standing wave that's uh, excited in this tool, which means also that the length of the tool and the frequency that we excite it at are very critical to getting good results down here at the bond point. Obviously, we at FNS BondTech uh, have taken care of that to make sure that the right ultrasonic frequency is provided and is used for the process and has an extremely stable process. That's very straightforward and that's really our business. Of course, things can go wrong and a couple of typical pitfalls are given here. Since we have a welding process that relies on friction of two parts against each other, it's very important that the battery cell itself is held very, very rigidly in place without any possibility of moving back and forth. If it were, then of course the friction between the wire and the cell would be unreliable and we would get no connection or in our view it's even worse if we get a bad connection that looks good at first and dies uh, after a year or two because obviously we want these connections to last as long as the, the entire battery module and in semiconductor business we expect a lifetime of a bond like this of easily 20 years. And if you think that in your car there are thousands of heavy wire bonds already in various electronic and electrical systems, that's exactly what you expect for all the electronics to last about 25 or 20 years. Here uh, we have just as an example, if, if a part like this battery cell is held softly, then it could be moving back and forth. And of course you would get uh, lousy ultrasonics because the uh, ultrasonic oscillation would be dissipated. Another problem can be if you have dirt on the surfaces, there can be all kinds of contaminations. This could be organic contaminants or also oxides, which can result from a variety of reasons. One is you can have different sources of cells coming from one supplier or from another supplier. You could also have different storage conditions in between, especially when you start up with a battery product. With a battery project, you may not immediately have a running process where cells come in, get processed, 
and are delivered out again in a short period of time. If you have parts sitting around for a while, they could be uh, uh, acquiring contaminations, but they could also be delivered with contaminants. So things could look like this, which makes life easy, uh, which makes life difficult again, because the bonding would be difficult on surfaces that are not completely clean. There is a, a variety of processes uh, to remove contaminants. One is, of course, mechanical or using a solvent. Uh, there is a laser treatment that you can use also. One of the treatments that we like a lot is blasting by dry ice, or also called CO2, snow. The way this works is quite straightforward. You have uh, one or several nozzles, and you push CO2 gas out under very, very high pressure. Since the two oil, uh, CO2 gas comes out of um, a high pressure um, tank, at room temperature. When releasing the pressure, it will actually cool off uh, and wind up as dry ice, which works a little bit like sandblasting. And so if we blast a jet like this over our uh, battery cells, over the poles, it will wind up cleaning those poles very, very efficiently. In fact, there are several, uh, several uh, process steps that happen at the same time. One is, of course, that the, um, the CO2 ice particles act a little bit like relatively soft sand, so they mechanically uh, grind off, as it were, uh, some of the contaminants. The other uh, way it works is that uh, the, the cold CO2, of course, freezes the surface to a degree, which makes the contamination contract differently from the from the substrate which cools off a little slower so we have a little bit of thermal blasting off uh, as well and of course finally we have the blowing action itself what it results in is that within a few seconds you have a very very clean surface what you can see here this is the surface after cleaning and we get an excellent bond without any extra trouble the way we can put this in the machine is, is several fold. One is you could add this externally. Here we have a typical uh, single nozzle blast. And here is a person just moving the, the module under this um, CO2 nozzle. We do it manually. And here we have maybe one or two seconds uh, for each blast um, on, the, on the battery cell. But in our bonding machine, where you see the bond head here with the bond tool at the bottom. We've added a CO2 cleaner side by side and the software is already made up so we can we can have a complete run where uh, the bonder first cleans every part, uh, cleans every bonding site and then bonds everything right afterwards without any extra, uh, extra work on the operator side. It's all programmed in already in a finished way. Here is what this whole process looks like. We have a battery module consisting of 16 cells in a 4x4 arrangement and we've put it under the bond head already. The process starts automatically. You see the bond head moving in position and here is the nozzle running over all of the bonding positions in an optimized pattern to give us the shortest time possible to reach all the spots. You can also see the beam. It's about 10 centimeters away from where we work and the whole process takes only about 10 seconds for it to run through. Okay, I've mentioned the equipment already. Uh, what do we offer in the way of equipment? Well, we have quite a range of equipment, really from the very first startup uh, in the small uh, production volumes to really large mass production volumes. We have automatic machines in the two series. One is our series 56X, and we have a large area work, a large working area of under 86X, which can actually be extended with fully automatic parts handling. And nicely enough, it can be upgraded to automation at any time. So even if you don't know at first what your production volumes are going to be, you could start out with one type of machine and then add automation later on, even at the customer side. What's an extra that nobody else offers is also you can have a bond tester, a machine that tests the bonds at any time uh, in the same machine just by changing the head. That's a unique feature. And let me show you how this works for us. Uh, 
The start out machine here is our desktop machine 56X. It uh, has one universal base machine with a working area of about 100 by 100 millimeters. It's already fully programmable for automatic operation, but uh, the operator would, put the, would feed the parts in one by one. What we do have uniquely is an exchangeable head for all the bonding uh, technologies. So if you bond batteries today and you have electronics of a different kind that you want also to bond, that with a different bonding process that could be done by changing heads, but you can also put uh, test heads on there, even with a new test technology called BAMFIT testing, which we'll uh, get to in just about a minute. All of these heads can be switched by the user in less than a minute, so this is really very, very easy uh, to use in practice. For larger volumes, but also for larger battery modules, we offer a machine called the 86X series. It's a much larger machine um, with a working area of uh, up to 512 by 700 uh, millimeters. So you have very, very large modules that you could work at one time. Or of course, you could feed the entire working area with many smaller modules. Again, it has uh, exchangeable bond heads and exchangeable test heads. And in fact, it uses the same bond heads or test heads from the previous model, from the 8F60, uh, from the 56 series. So you could switch from one to another quite easily. Again, you also have the Bamfit reliability test system available. And you have the very same software as the smaller model. So if you start out with one machine and upgrade to a, late, uh, to a bigger machine later on, you still would not have to do any retraining of the operators. You have the identical software. And this is the machine where we can also include the CO2 cleaning head as well. Here we show the, the working area of 720 millimeters width and 500 plus millimeter in depth. And of course, if you think even bigger later on, you could either have automatic parts feeding added on or uh, have like a robot, for instance, uh, put the parts in uh, and take them out again. And all that uh, automation could be retrofitted at any time without having to send the machine back to us. Uh, if you have to have any tailor-made automation, again, no problem. Uh, this is something we do a lot. Now, uh, an important point is, of course, how do you check that your bond quality is perfect? In wire bonding for any type of purpose in semiconductor, Bond quality testing, of course, is a central point. Uh, there are essentially two standard methods for wire bonds that are used globally. One is the pull test and the second one is the shear test. Both of them can be done on our equipment, as mentioned before. And let's just have a look at uh, how this works. Uh, what we do have, what nobody else has, we have it fully automated. So automatic testing is actually patented for us. Here is what the test looks like. We have a hook that goes under the wire loop and pulls up, measuring the force at which the loop breaks. It can also happen that the bond itself breaks or that the wire breaks right behind the bond. We just measure the force at which this happened and this gives us a very good quality uh, measurement. The other test, the shear test, there we push the bond directly and try to uh, measure the force that it takes to push the bond away. As you can see here, uh, this happens fully automatically. So we can program all the bond positions and have the tester measure them uh, one by one. In, in this case here, in what's called a destructive test. And you can see we can do a whole module in this way. Here you have a typical control chart of uh, here was about 190 bonds and you have also a distribution which normally should be a gaussian normal distribution the typical bell-shaped curve which you would like to see for this kind of quality data um, again the the type of um, report you get could have uh, your own formats there are many different ways this can be done these reports are generated automatically in, as I said, different formats. Finally, you automatically also get a quality parameter like a CPK value automatically out of this in, in all kinds of formats. But we have one additional uh, way of testing 
for reliability that nobody else has at the moment. And that's uh, what I mentioned before as the Bamford test. Uh, when you do reliability tests in power semiconductors, the standard test is running power cycles where you turn the part under test on and off uh, because typically uh, the, t uh, the part will fail because of the different heat um, load that it sees. The thermal load from turning on and turning off uh, is really, or the cycling in that is really what stresses the parts. So in practice, the test done for that uh, to model the real life load on, on the real life stress on a part is called the, the standard power cycle test. But of course, if you have a part that's very robust, it will withstand millions of cycles before failing. And even if the cycles are only five seconds between turning on and turning off, this could be a few months before the part fails. Now, there was a very clever shortcut developed by the Technical University of Vienna. Uh, what you do is instead of letting the part expand and contract thermally uh, because of the turning on and turning off, you model the same stress, uh, this mechanical stress that's created by the thermal, um, by the thermal load. You, you model this by a mechanical uh, fashion, by simply gripping the part and moving it back and forth mechanically, in fact, even by, ultra, by an ultrasonic vibration. Um, that's called uh, BAMFIT, Bontech Accelerated Mechanical Fatigue Interconnection Test, and has a patented test head uh, developed with the Technical University of Vienna. We have a special presentation about that, uh, which you can also look at um, on our internet site, so I won't go into any more details about this. Uh, let me just finish up by saying that it's not only equipment that we can help you with, we can actually help you get started um, but in, a, in a variety of ways. Uh, we have services beyond or before the hardware supply, such as feasibility studies, so we can bond, uh, we can help you de design your battery module. We can also help you with prototype manufacturing, the first few or the, even the first few dozen parts before you go into manufacturing yourself. And we have actually done contract manufacturing even for smaller volumes, simply to help you with the ramp up or to help you also convincing your customers um, of your capabilities in this field before you go and invest in hardware yourself. So there we help uh, customers quite a bit around this whole field, become successful in uh, making battery modules. And when you're ready for this, please talk to us. We are ready when you are. You can call us, uh, you can look us up at our internet site and we'd be happy to help you at any time. Thank you for listening and whenever you're ready,